out to the house of the Lord tonight. We've got much to be in prayer for tonight, many on our prayer list um, that we need to pray for tonight. So remember those. Is there anybody, anybody that needs to be added or removed from prayer list? Barbara Whitlow. Dickie or Richard, yeah. All right, remember him. What kind? I don't know. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm. All right. Anybody else? If not, Mike, will you open us up in prayer? Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, we'll go to the book of Revelation, chapter number one tonight. The book of Revelation, chapter number one. <clears throat> Revelation, chapter number one. We started in the book of Revelation two Wednesday nights ago, got through the introduction, and tonight we're going to pick up in verse number four through verse number six. We'll deal with the course of the age tonight in the book of Revelation, chapter number one. And I uh, hope we all can learn something together. As we look at the course of the age, we notice that the writer here, and it got, starts all Revelation starts off in verse number one, I believe. Let me get, I forgot to put this verse in here. Revelation 1 1 starts off here. Let me get it right here. I should have had it marked. The revelation which God, uh, or the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. Notice this tonight, it's not the it's not the revelation of John, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. John starts off in verse number 4 when he says, "Grace be unto you and peace." And so when you think about it verse number 4 being grace be unto you and peace, we can think this as more like a Pauline epistle, that would something that would Paul would say. And instead of an apocalypse or a tribulation book of the Bible, a judgment book of the Bible. And I'm glad tonight, even through the judgment periods throughout the world, God has given us grace and peace to overcome those. And tonight as we get there, so tonight I want us to get in verse number 4 and verse number 5 and verse number 6 tonight. And as we look at the course of the age, number one, I want us to look at the blessing that, that is given to us here. The blessing. Number one, I want us to look at the substance of the blessing. The Bible says in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is. We know that this book primarily deals with judgment, but yet God begins it with grace. Our lives today, each and every man and woman that is lost and had done without God, is known according to the word of God in the book of, I think it's the book of Ephesians, it calls them the children of wrath. And when God saves a man and gives him grace to believe in him, Man becomes not, no longer a child of wrath, but becomes a son of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Yet revel, God begins revelation by telling men what they can have, what they ha can have is not what they deserve. And that is the grace of God. None of us tonight have done anything to have done anything to deserve the grace of God. God has given us the peace of God, peace which surpasseth all understanding tonight. When I think about peace, I think about a story of a man that entered into a church service right during World War II. And at the beginning of World War II, he walked into a church service and said, I was, I've come in to tell you that there is war. 
and we are going to war. And the writer said, during that time, he said another gentleman stepped up and began to say the words of this song. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin. The blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace, with sorrow surging round. On Jesus' bosom, naught but peace is found. Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away. In Jesus' keeping we are safe, and they. He said, peace, perfect peace, the future all unknown. Jesus we know, and he is still on his throne. He said, peace, perfect peace, death shadowing us and ours. Jesus has conquered, conquered death and all its powers. It is enough, our struggles soon shall cease. And Jesus leads us to heaven's perfect peace. And I'm glad tonight that God himself can give us peace when there is no peace. There, The Bible says in last days that there will be men that cries out, peace, peace, when there is no peace. People's wanting to see peace treaties signed here, peace treaties signed there. There will never be a peace treaty signed until God comes back that will not be broken. The Holy Spirit begins this war-filled book with peace. Tonight we can study throughout the book of Revelation with peace because grace has been applied to our lives. At the end of the book, we'll see the storm clouds all roll away and the drums of war are stilled, the earth itself purged with fire. And there will emerge a new heaven and a new earth which dwell righteousness where all grace and peace. And that is the substance of our blessing. Secondly tonight, everybody good on that first part? Good, say amen. All right, secondly tonight, I want us to look at the source of our blessing. The source of our blessing. John says, John to the verse number four, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. From him which is, notice this, and which was, and what's the next part? And which is to come. When we think about that, we see the three pat we see the three tenses of Christ. We see him when he was on this earth, or it, he's in the third person here, he's in the Holy Spirit, he said, which is, that means he's presently with us, right? Which was, which would have been the man Jesus Christ, the man uh, Jesus, who was here, but he ascended and went with his Father to, in heaven, and then is to come. That's when he shall return to this world. John gives all three tenses of God here. When we think about this, no one other than God the Father is presented to us as one who transcends all the times, who lives in the past, the present, and the prophecies of time. Tonight we have a past, that's everything that is behind us, we have a present, that's everything that we're at now, but we don't know our future, but God does. He knows our past, our present, and our future. When I think about that tonight, it's a great thing to know that our God is so big and so powerful. When we think about this tonight, we can go over to the book of Ecclesiastes, Chapter number 3 tonight, take your Bibles with me, go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number 3 tonight, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, after the book of Proverbs, which is after the book of Genesis in your Bible, way after the book of Genesis in your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. When you find your place there, say amen. amen. Verse number 15. The Bible says, That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And notice this. And God requireth that which is what? Past. If we took that verse of Scripture tonight and put it in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 4, I believe we would see the which is, which was, and which is to come. 
And tonight when we think about this, there are many reasons for the blessing that God has bestowed on us. Number one, the blessing comes from God the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, and is to come, and from the seven, notice this, spirits. The word spirits there is in what kind of lettering? Capital, right? When we see the word capital and the spirit here, it has to be talking about the Holy Spirit, which are before his throne. Some thinks that this refers to angelic beings. There's no way. Because the blessing comes from the Father and the Son. This reference makes no other remark about one person and that being the Holy Spirit. No, and the Bible says, which are before his throne. There is no, <clears throat> let me see where I can find it. No created being with the perfection of the Spirit's person and with the plenitude of his power. He is seen taking up a position before the throne because he is the executor of, notice this, God's purposes. Until now, he has been the executor of God's purpose, purposes in grace. He is now the executor in God's purposes in government. Even so, the saints will know nothing but grace and peace from him. Not only do we see it come from the Spirit, from the Holy Spirit, but we also see the blessing comes from God the Son. Verse number 5. And the Bible says, and from who? Jesus Christ. When we think about that today, we know that he has three titles, which was taken together to reveal his relationship to the present age. We see the blessing comes from Jesus Christ, who is a, notice this, faithful witness. When we think about a faithful witness, a friend of mine is on a, is on a uh, jury this week and on a murder trial. And we was talking yesterday and he was telling me a little bit about what was going on. And I'm far enough away, I didn't know nothing about it, don't want to know nothing about it till it's over. And he, he made a statement. He said, the first witness ain't even approached the stand yet and I think the verdict is X. And I said, whoa. And tonight, when we think about a witness, if you had to go to court tonight for someone and you had to be their character witness, you would hope and pray if you was the one that was relying on that person that they would be a what kind of witness? Faithful. Tonight, John says, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness? When we think about him being the faithful witness, he came to the earth to be a witness to the dark and, de and degenerate world. His witness was both unprecedented and unpopular. He witnessed to the name of God. In Old Testament times, God was frequently revealed through his many varied names, which unfolded the aspect of his character. Jesus taught men a new name for God, the lovely, the lovely intimate, heartwarming of the Father. He told them of what was to come. The Bible says here, and the first begotten of the dead. When I think about him witnessing tonight, I think about him witnessing, first of all, to the nature of sin. When we think about that, we go over to Isaiah chapter number 53. The Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace, of our peace was upon him. It was our sin that he witnessed as he died on the cross for us so that we could have ultimate forgiveness. He witnessed to the need of righteousness because he said, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are what? Sick. He said, I come not to call the, righteousness to, the righteous to repentance, but I come to seek and to save those which are lost. He realized that this world needed someone else to be righteous. He witnessed the nearness of judgment. He spoke more about hell in his ministry than he did about heaven. We also see that he, as the faithful witness, brought the news of salvation. He imparted the news to good and bad alike. He gave the witness of the woman at the well. 
He gave the witness to Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. He gave the witness to the, to the rich young ruler who rejected him. He gave the witness to those that have claimed to keep the law but failed to accept the gospel. He gave the witness to Zacchaeus who was known as a little man and Christ kept becoming a faithful witness. We also note how the age continues. The blessing is from Jesus Christ, the first begotten dead. The Bible says that he has tasted death for who? Every man. Tonight when we think about that, he's risen in triumph from the tomb and ascended into glory there to implement the plans and the purposes of God for this age. The first begotten is implying the priority and the sovereignty of God for this age. There is a man in the glory actively engaged in promoting interest of God for this age. He is building a church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. I'm glad he's a faithful witness tonight, aren't you? When we get on to that, he concludes and he says, And the prince of the kings of the earth. We see that the blessing of the Lord wasn't just to be any man, wasn't just to be the to be the begotten, the first begotten of the dead, but the prince of the kings, who once was born in a barn to die on a cross, is coming back to reign with authority, with royalty, and with dignity. The Bible says that God is the one who puts king, raises kings up and he puts kings down. And tonight, when the Antichrist is revealed on this earth, everyone that is fell for the Antichrist's lies will be doomed to hell. And when God cleans the slate and comes back, he will set up his kingdom to rule and reign forever. Are we good on that part so far? All right, let's move to the second part tonight. Verse number 5 and verse number 6. I ain't going too fast, am I? All right. Verse number 5 and verse number 6 tonight. We're going to look at the benediction here in the first part of Revelation chapter number 1. The benediction, the Bible says in verse number 5, unto, in the last part, unto him that loved us and washed us from our what? Sins. Notice this tonight. He didn't just say sin. And tonight I've heard people say, well, the only reason men and women die and go to hell is because of the sin of unbelief. To, the, to some extent, that is true. To another extent, that is not true. Because it's more than unbelief that Christ died on the cross for. Would y'all agree with that tonight? If a man loves a sin more than he wants God, it isn't just unbelief that sends him to hell, but it's the sin that he loved more than he wanted Christ that sent him to hell. He said our sins in his own blood. I want to say tonight, when we look at the benediction tonight, the last part of verse number 6, we see that the grace that is accrued to us. The blessing has hardly been uttered when the saints breathe back in answering a benediction. The benediction tells of the grace that accrues to us. It is the grace that endures. And the saints respond to the blessing in verse number, <clears throat> excuse me. The saints respond to the blessing when we talk about in his own blood. He did it for us because he hath loved us. Unto him that loved us. Why do we love Christ tonight? Because he first loved us. Why should we live for Christ tonight? Because he gave his life so that I could live. Paul said tonight, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Tonight we see the grace that occurs to us. This benediction rejoices in the grace that emancipates. He said unto him that washed us from our sins in his own blood. The payment of your sin has been paid to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who accepts Jesus Christ. Tonight, why would a person want to die in their sins and go to hell when Christ has said, I will set you free 
from your sin, from the penalty of your sin, from the punishment of your sin. And you can have my son living on the inside of you to keep you from the penalty and the wrath to come. Not only that, but the benediction speaks of grace that elevates Christ. Go with me to verse number 6 tonight. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. When I think about that tonight, go with me to the book of Ephesians. If you have your Bibles tonight, go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter number 2 tonight. Ephesians chapter number 2 comes after the book of Galatians in your Bibles. Ephesians chapter number 2 tonight. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. When you find your place there, say amen. All right. The Bible says in uh, verse number 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, whereth he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and by grace ye are saved. Notice this tonight, verse number 6. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit in where? Heavenly places with who? Christ Jesus. Well, we see this tonight. He said he hath raised us up together, and he's made us sit together in high places. What are these high places? Well, he said he hath made us kings and priests unto who? God. When we think about that tonight, I think about the prodigal son. Went out, spent all of the money, all of, it, all of his wealth, and everything that God, or everything that his father had given him. When the prodigal son came back home, the father did what? Clothed him, put shoes on his feet, and put a ring on his hand. What did the ring syndicate? Power. Tonight, God takes us that are weak, takes us that were once lost. He saves us, raises us up together, fills us with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can live Christian lives pleasing and acceptable unto God. Y'all with me tonight? When I think about that tonight, the spots of the redeemed, he has bestowed on us all the majesty of the prince and the ministry of the priest. He has given us the power with men and power with God. The power with men, preacher, what do you mean by that? He gives us the opportunity to take the gospel to every man. It would be something tonight to be a a uh, speaker for the president, uh, like a messenger for the president or for the king or for a queen or for any of that. But tonight, church, we have the greatest message that we could ever tell, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ultimate king, the ultimate father. We can go to those who have no father and said, let me tell you, you may not have an earthly father, but let me tell you about a heavenly father. My Father who is rich in mercy and in grace, who is rich enough that he could feed all of the sparrows in the world and never go broke. He makes sure that every one of us have plenty to eat. And he blesses us every day with new grace. He's the Father. The Bible also here in the last part of verse number 6, and we're almost done. To the glory that accrues to him. When I think about that tonight, the benediction here, not only does it talk about the glory that accrues to us, the glory, or the grace that accrues to us, but the glory that's given to God. To him be the glory and dominion forever and what? Ever. What does that word forever and ever mean? Never ending, right? Means that it'll never run out. When we think about that, his glory that outshines the sun. When we think about the glory of God, I think about Moses. When he seen a glimpse of God, he come down off the mount. And there was something different about him. Just a glimpse. The Bible talks about that he is, <clears throat> excuse me, that he is, the, he is the light of that city talking about heaven 
There is no day, there is no night, for he is the light. That light that is in heaven is the light that shines through you and I as Christians tonight. When you, came in, when you pulled up into the parking lot tonight, I'm sure that most of us looked around to make sure that the lights were on in the church. Why? Why do we have lights on? So that we can what? See. Tonight in your Christian life is your light shining so brightly before men that they know that God is inside of you. It is the glory one day that will be acknowledged by all mankind. The Bible says, And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, He is Lord. It is the glory that when He returns, the dominion will be all His as well. When I think about this tonight, I think about a story I read about a preacher out of Scotland by the name of Thomas Chalmers. In his early ministry, he was an un, in his early days, he was, was, un, was an unconverted man. He was pastoring a congr small congregation after he got saved, and he secretly wanted to be a professor in mathematics. He went to the University of Edinburgh and devoted most of his time when he ended, he wrote a pamphlet expressing his view that a minister could easily discharge his pastoral obligation in two days, leaving the remainder of the week for free for the pursuit of any job that he wanted. Then came Chalmers' conversion as God began to talk about him and God began to bless his ministry. Much later in his career, Chalmers attended a conference of the leaders of his denomination and one of the fellow ministers jealous of Chalmers' success read the pamphlet penned by Chalmers in his earlier days and he said did you write that and Chalmers said yes I wrote that rising to his feet he said I wrote it strangely blinded as I was in those days I wanted to be a professor but what, sir, is mathematics? Is it the magnitude of the proportion of magnitude in those unregenerate days? I had forgotten two magnitudes. He said, I have forgotten the shortness of time. Notice this. I've forgotten the shortness of time, and I'd forgotten the length of eternity. And he said, when I realized the shortness of time and the length of eternity, I realized that I would be better as a pastor than I would be a professor. Tonight, friend, we must realize that whether you die at the age of one or if you die at the age of 101, life is short compared to all of eternity. When we think about the power of God and the glory of God, God, not for one moment, has never lost sight of eternity. I believe the reason that we could say there's Bible to back that up is because Jesus said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that how many? All should come to repentance. God created hell tonight for the devils and his angels. God does not send a man to hell. Man chooses to reject God and go to hell. Are y'all with me tonight? When we think about that tonight, the writer finishes here and says to him, be glory and dominion. Notice this, forever and ever. Amen. In other words, from the beginning of time, through the end of time, through all of eternity, the glory and the dominion of God will stand forever. Tonight, if we know that the glory of God will stand forever, we know that the kingdom and the dominion of God will stand forever. You and I should rest in the peace of God tonight that no matter how wicked this world becomes, no matter how evil this world is, that God will and God can take care of all of us. And as we get into later on next week into the book of Revelation, 
We will start getting a little bit deeper. I try not to rush through the book of Revelation. I'm trying to be very um, slow so that we can all digest it. But John will pick up in verse number 7, verse number 8. And I like what he says when Jesus tells John, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. In other words, I am the one that started this, and I will be the one that ends this. In other words, there's nothing that is going to take me by surprise. God, when he created, and I'm done, God, when he created Adam and Eve, knew that Adam and Eve would sin in the garden that would cost his son's life. And then he knew that because of that, that mankind would need a Savior. He said, I'll send my son. Then he knew that mankind would need a deliverer. Well, wait a minute. He would need a comforter. He said, that's fine. He said, I'll send into heaven. I'll send a comforter down to you, that comforter being the Holy Ghost. And then he said, wait a minute. Not only that, but you're going to need a deliverer. So he said, when I go away, he said... I will come again that where I am, there ye may be also. He said, I created man. Mankind's going to sin. I'm going to send my son into the world to save mankind. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to indwell mankind, to comfort mankind. And then I'm going to send my son back to the world to deliver mankind before I pour out the judgment on this world. It was all in the plan and the hand of God. So any questions, any comments, any concerns? That was, I felt like a lot 